so you can give me any um, thumbs up. But um, thanks for joining so much. I'm going to talk just a little bit about how um, thinking like a network scientist is something that you might be able to um, use some concepts of network science in, in in everyday life, and then hopefully show an example of how we've used it um, in some projects and research um, to translate it into practice examples. Um, I, just, I mentioned I, I have a company called Visible Network Labs and our, our mission, we exist to make invisible networks visible because we've just seen the power um, and the, the progress that we can make on outcomes when we're able to make this complex kind of way of working together and thinking about relationships visible um, to people. And I mentioned I'm a technologist, so my primary life's work has been building a platform called Partner which stands for the program to analyze, record, and track networks to enhance relationships. Um, it's been funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and we use it in two ways. One as Partner Me, which is a way to understand a person's personal support network in a couple of minutes, and then hopefully translate that into their care um, through the knowledge that you gain. And then our partner CPRM stands for the Community Partner Relationship Management System, and folks are using that like a CRM, but more to as a data tracking and learning tool for how to track community networks and learn from that, and then um, make decisions and, and report and tell the story of their networks. Um, hopefully I'll get to show a little bit of that in a moment, but the, the reason I do this work is we've seen um, quite a growth in the network way of working. Um, and I used to have this slide that said the new paradigm, and now it's just a norm. We just know that um, there are expectations now across the workforce, whether you are working um, on a community network or trying to build your own personal network that we no longer can just work in silos and that working across boundaries is going to bring us benefit. But what we've noticed is people don't really get a lot of resources and, and um, tools for how to do that. So this is what got me started on thinking about how to take network science and translate it into ways that people can use and you know take home today. Um, I'm going to kind of go through some of these that I already mentioned, but I do think it's important to note when I say networks what I mean, and I really need these nodes and lines, um, and these nodes are uh, the circles and a map like I'll show you soon that have uh, can represent people or organizations. We work with a lot of groups today that think of whole ecosystems, so these could be events, um, things like that, and the lines between them are their relationships, and we're trying to uh, measure those in different ways so we can look at patterns, we can make sense of this and understand why two people or organizations connected to each other. Um, what what was the um, reason that that happened and then what is the outcome of that? So I'm going to just for a moment sound like a little bit of a professor and then I'll try to bring it back um, to practice. But I use uh, network science and a lot of us on this call have. I mentioned in the last group I've never been around so many network scientists. Um, as unique lens and a basic network science principle that um, we follow is this idea that more is not always better. And a lot of people have talked about th that today, how basically more networking does not necessarily equate to, whoops, better networking. Did I just lose you all on my screen? There we go. I'm having a little trouble navigating teams. Um, but for a moment, let me let me um, talk about some theories that help us navigate how more can um, maybe not always be better. So for just a moment, if you look and see this orange node and imagine that that's you, we've all come to this call today with our own set of connections. We call these our strong ties. And these strong ties are often um, those ties to people who are a lot like us. Maybe they think like us, they have access to similar resources, they may even look like us. We call that homophily. It's this idea that birds of a feather flock together and it's the way networks just naturally form. But over the last few years and decades really there's been a lot more attention to what if we cross boundaries and we um you know get into each other's social substructures in a way um that bring us um ideas and innovation and access to diversity and so we call these dotted lines our weak ties and there was a man uh in the seven in the 70s mark granovetter who did his dissertation work on how people get jobs and he said i think people get jobs through the um, connections they have which isn't really 
all that fascinating and, and new, but what he found was that we get jobs through these weak ties, not our strong ties, because those people may know about jobs we don't know about. And he called that the strength of weak ties. And the strength of weak ties is really what's been adopted in terms of um, kind of the benefit of networking. However, it's very overwhelming to have networks that are chaotic like this. So there's another guy, Ron Burt, and he said, um, I like your ideas, Mark Granovetter, but perhaps um, we can do this in a more efficient and effective way. And what if we just connect to one person in each of those sub networks or one organization that may be a gatekeeper to a hard to reach population or maybe, um, you know, someone who's well trusted in a group of policymakers or funders. And if we can just figure out who that is and nurture that connection, we can actually create new relationships to new sub networks, increasing our collaborative advantage but through fewer numbers of connections. So when a lot of us are talking about, you know, not having to do more networking all the time, here's a concept that you can apply. Actually, I apply this in my work life and my personal life because I'm very busy and I don't, um, I, I try very hard to, you know, not copy everyone on an email, but figure out how to kind of maximize uh, my connections through, through numbers of, um, touch points. And what that allows me to do is when I know I need to activate a network like this, I can um, nurture this enough and then basically help activate networks um, only when they're needed, but not worry so much that I'm going to lose these relationships. Um, so one thing I hope if you remember nothing else from today is that you can manage relationships to create network strategies, but I truly believe that you need data to do it. We're, we often think because we're human, we can just... Um, do this kind of work because we're expected to know how to deal with relationships. And I personally think relationships are one of the hardest things to manage. And so not only in my personal life, but then having to come to work and 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 do that is really difficult without a tool and a and a science. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that and I want to leave some room for questions, but um, Two more quick slides on this of um, some of these concepts. This is how we've applied this concept in some of real world situations. So we know there is a lot of work today um, around building community networks, getting diverse organizations together, you know, building on the strength of weak ties. Um, in this slide, you'll see in the center all these squares and circles, um, let's say they're organizations, they actually remain in the same place in every picture around here. And all that's changing is the ties. And so you'll see this is called the life cycle of a sustainable network. And the goal here, um, we've been tracking um, through research for many, many years on how networks evolve and when they are effective. And what we've found is that it's very common for a group of organizations, for example, to come together and basically um, do, uh, you know, the work of networking, um, start uh, working together, and they often make a list of who's not already at the table. Very quickly, we invite those people, that's network building, and then we get to phase three, which is growing the network with a strategy that more is better. And most of the groups that I work with are here. So what we're really trying to work with is, what if, say, this group made four priority areas, had four uh, times of um, like for let's say four individuals who they trusted who could lead those groups let's say this group meets weekly monthly um you know quarterly and annually and they trust these folks in the middle to get communication across the whole network but they're all given a role and they all are only invited to come when they know what they're going to be asked to do and maybe once or twice a year we all get together and what we're testing and we're finding is that when networks um put a structure together like this, they tend to actually have more success at sustainability. People are not worried they're going to be asked to come too often. We um, and we encourage people to talk about what the end of the network is. Um, so there's just some principles around more is not better that actually really increase the sustainability of networks over time, especially after people kind of get exhausted from them and maybe even our funding goes away. Um, and I'd like to end the network science piece on this like network science in real life little story. Um, and this is a story of planning a wedding. Um, and so um, this is actually my a picture of my wedding and the people who were invited to it. And because I'm a big network geek and I I love to do this stuff, I was trying to do the work of, you know, who would um, where would people sit at a wedding? And what I learned is that 
you know, most people either sit people together because they'll be very comfortable, or there's the adventurous folks who seat people apart from each other because they'll know they'll build new networks. So I went through my list of people invited and put everyone in and gave everyone at least just one connection and then a, um, a, a, a color that an attribute that helped me know where they are, who they are. And then when I visualized it, I thought this is really great. Um, pragmatic me was like, I can just make little eight tops out of this. <laughs> but what I thought instead, what I realized quite quickly was what I saw here was what this is, is called a component where everyone in it is connected to at least one other. And these um, are small components, but this is actually called a closed network and over here an open network. And there's lots of debate out there on what's better. Um, probably depends on if you're an extrovert or introvert, but this is my network over here of friends and family. And this was my husband's network. And it's the first time I realized in all our years together that everyone in his network knew each other. And what a fascinating and different world it was. Um, for me that I had pe most people in my world don't know each other. And it really did tell me a lot about the ways in which we um, interact and the way we interact differently. And so um, I just like to use this because my, my point really is you are a network scientist and you're using it every day. Um, and it's really something that is very tangible because we are human. Um, and um, we're just uh, applying it all of the time. I'm going to share these slides with the takeaways and things like that, but I just want to end with just a, a couple of slides on um, how we've used this on um, in real life. I work with a woman uh, named Dr. Ayala Tommy who's trying to help um, solve kind of a problem for families, which is how to navigate systems of care for babies and young children with special health care and developmental needs. And I'm going to go through this a little bit quickly. I don't mean to really do a whole research presentation, but the story around this is that we did this work um, together and we uh, looked at Colorado and we found um, who was connected to whom around this system of care and how they were working together. Um, and as we did this work, it was really fascinating. People in the system like to see the work. They like to see the systems and where they are. And then we would try to strategize how to improve care for families. We even do exercises like this to help people kind of conceptualize networks um, as they are working to build them. But when we took this work to families, families didn't respond as positively. And they said, we don't really care what you all are doing at your systems level, but when I need help, I go to my friends and family, neighbors and church. Um, and when I need that system, I just want an easy way to get there. So we started doing research where we asked people to draw pictures of their social supports. And this is a family of twins with special um, health care needs. And you'll see in the box, it's all the informal supports, which are their strong ties. The periphery are those systems levels um, supports that we work very hard on coordinating for people. But when we really started doing a lot of research and looking at the comparison, we see that the perception of what works for families is very different from what works when we're doing this at the systems level. Um, so we couldn't find patterns on how people um, build social support. I couldn't tell from looking at any of you today what kind of social support you have or not. But we did find everyone said they prefer their informal supports first and they want to help themselves. They don't necessarily want to be part of a system, which is probably true for you, too. So we started asking questions like, why are we trying to build perfect systems and why aren't we building systems that adapt around people? So Ayala and I started saying, we need to better understand how people present in variances across their social support in order to build those adaptive systems. So I'll just show you real quick. I mentioned it during an earlier piece. Um, we've built Partner Me, which is a way that we can screen people on things like their health and how they feel lonely or isolated. But we'll ask people, we'll use this network science approach to draw a picture for people as they list who's part of their social supports. And we'll ask them with their finger or mouse to tell us if they could, who of these people, for example, could coordinate care today for them if they needed help. And we'll ask them to what degree do you trust these people to help you and what degree do you depend on them? We'll also ask them like, what are your special or your pressing needs, um, social economic needs or social determinants of health? And when they tell us, usually they get referred to resources, but we try to take this network science lens and say, these are the people you said help you. These are the things you said you need. And because we know people wanna help themselves, we say, who's helping you with the things you need? So here I may, it's a strengths-based approach. We wanna bring the assets that people have into their care. So here I might be able to say, it looks like you're doing a good job with childcare and food, but no one's helping you with work. 
So all this stuff lets us know people very quickly in ways um, that we couldn't before. Um, so I'm just skimming through these real quick. We also can link to resource databases so we can make really personalized um, referrals based on knowing what kind of care they need based on their variances. Um, and the last slide I actually want to get to is just, this is my daughter um, presenting with me on how we can use this for kids in ways that help them draw pictures and talk about things that are very hard for them around relationships and complex things um, related to uh, relationships using technology and pictures, um, but bringing the science all together um, in that. So I know I'm getting very close to the end, so I'm going to stop sharing, I think, and see if there's any questions or things that people wanted to, to talk about or, or relate to. You all are an easy crowd. I have, I have <laughs> a question about, oh, sorry. OK, I, I, guess I have a question just about. Yeah. Like determining which are your important bit, like, so professionally, not kind of personally, but. Navigating that, you know, if you're setting up or you're trying to work out what networks you need, how do you determine what are the strong ones or is it trial and error? And actually you try that out and think, no, actually, that's not what I need. Like it's. Is, is there any science to that or is it a bit more trial yeah. and error? I um I always believe you kind of have to wade the waters first. You kind of have to get in it and just sense it. But I really believe that hopefully what all of you will take away today is just a mindset shift. This idea that you can manipulate your networks, hopefully for good, changes the way you see the world. So suddenly if you start to say, I can discriminate with who I'm going to connect to, um, you might look for those that seem well connected to others. And, and focus on them and then that you trust them and they seem trusted by others so if you have to quickly pick i i do this i i am an I advisor at the school of public health and i also do research there and i have picked one person in each of those categories that i connect to and sometimes they leave and i have to replace that connection um and it's taken me a little bit of time to figure out who they are so um I do think there is a whole network analysis approach and data you can collect, um, but you're asking, how do I do this like as a human on the fly? I guarantee if you change your mindset a little bit about how you approach this, you'll you'll you you are a network scientist and you'll become very good at it soon, Lola. <laughs> I believe. <laughs> Mark, you had a question. Grace, are we out of time? <laughs> yes, I, I, I was just going to say I'm mindful Mark's got a question, but I know that the main session will be closing, so I just don't want anybody to miss anything from, from that session. Okay. Should so I think question? what will okay. happen, yeah, so if everybody can leave this session and head back to um, the okay. main session, I think you'll you'll definitely catch the closing then. Okay, so I didn't leave enough time for that, but I'm available. <laughs> Thank you. Lovely to meet you all. Sorry to cut it short. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs>